I want to show now how, starting with the physics that we've talked about, things like the speed of light is the same for all observers, and concepts like proper time, we've seen already how that links to the geometry of Minkowski, uh, Minkowski space. And now I finally want to go back to coordinates. We introduced them a tiny bit at the start, but then I was very explicit about how I wanted to get away from them. Now we can reintroduce them in a, in a really motivated way. Too often, I think, with relativity, you kind of start here, then express the physics in the coordinates, and then you show that it didn't really depend on the coordinates, and then maybe as an afterthought, you, thought, you think about geometry. And I like this progression better. Okay, um, So what we've done in the last video is with an observer A, we declare that world line, an unaccelerated observer's straight line, to be the t-axis pick some event along that world line, and then we figured out a way with laser, ra laser or radar ranging to figure out physically what the orthogonal sh complement should be. And that's the, the space direction according to this observer. And it's going to depend on the observer there. Okay. Um, and then we can extend that. We can take, it's easy to look at parallel observers or look at later events. And we could do that in a nice way. We could do that in a way, let's say, we make all these spaced by translating by some vector, let's say, EX, where that's a unit vector. Let's say that's one light second of, of a distance. And then have these spacings be a vector that's ET, basis vector in the T direction. And then that maybe would be one second. So one second of time, one light second of distance, we're just going to call it one. We're just going to ignore the units as usual. Okay. Um, and, of course, we discovered that for one to be purely space and one to be purely time, so that this is only motion and time, and so that these guys are considered to be simultaneous events, these should be perpendicular. Or, in other words, the scalar product should be zero. Okay. So this is a special kind of coordinate system called a Lorentz coordinate system. Because physically, the progression I was talking about that I don't like, that it, or historically, that's really what happened, is that Lorentz figured out sort of these weird coordinate transformations that seemed to make everything work out, but didn't have a very good interpretation for them. Einstein had the physical interpretation, which was essentially geometrical, and then other folks, including some mathematicians, said, yeah, it really is a kind of geometry. Um, so this is called the Lorentz coordinate system, where it's very much like the usual kind of coordinate system you would have in ordinary geometry. You have the um, the unit vectors along the coordinate axis be unit vectors, and they're supposed to be orthogonal. It's just that that has different a different kind of uh, flavor in the Minkowski case, but the, the link to the geometry is the same. Okay, so it's analogous to saying in Euclidean geometry, this is a good coordinate system, or this is a good coordinate system, equally spaced. Uh, grid lines that are perpendicular to each other. These are good for Euclidean geometry. This kind of coordinate system is not a good one for Euclidean geometry. It's something you can use, but the formulas will not be as nice. So I'm going to show you um, that in just a second. One thing we can use this for, a very simple thing we can use this for, is something I kind of implicitly promised last time, which was to talk a little bit more about speed and velocity. Okay, There's one kind of velocity that we know a lot about, and it has these sort of funky properties. That's the velocity of light. So light always goes at speed 1, because we define, we use units of time and space that, that match up. Okay, um, But what about other velocities? Like, for example, a material particle. Something particle. Okay. Well, you know what? We define it in exactly the usual way now that we've got these coordinates. And we have to use these nice kinds of coordinates or else it won't, we won't get the right notion. But we just say, let's suppose we have a material particle going between coordinate x1 and t1 there. And I don't have a lot of room up here, so you can probably guess what it's going to be, x2, t2. And then the velocity of that thing relative to observer a 
is going to be x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1, just delta x over delta t, the usual. Not a weird, funky notion of velocity. And something I won't actually prove, probably be useful, <coughs> but I'm not going to do it, is that you can do this for light, and you will always get 1, OK? Um, that, there, that just kind of confirms that this is the right notion because it agrees with what we already know should be true for, for light. So this is one of those funky things about relativity <coughs> that, again, you've probably, <coughs> probably heard, is that velocities definitely are relative. That's true for any kind of, of uh, an analysis of physics. If I'm on a moving train, then my hand is not moving relative to me, but my hand is move, very much moving relative to the station that the train passes through. Um, but the funky thing is that there's this one kind of particle, light, where the velocity is not relative. We will come back, <coughs> hopefully, I'll extend these uh, lectures enough, to talk about um, like addition of velocities and how that behaves in a very interesting way in relativity, because that is not trivial. But the definition of velocity in a Lorentz coordinate system is exactly what we'd expect. OK, so let me <coughs> close a circle here. We had, at the very start of the lectures, uh, these lectures, I gave you a formula for the Minkowski scalar product in coordinates, but then we've gone away from that. And <coughs> let me go back to green here. Remember, what we've, all we've been using about the Minkowski scalar product, the only things we've really been using about the geometry is that it's symmetric and <coughs> bilinear and indefinite. And you have to make that a little bit more precise in more than two dimensions, um, just like how many minus signs, basically. Okay, But just basically here that there are some vectors that have positive uh, quadratic form, some vectors that have negative, basically, okay? And that's all that we use geometrically, and those um, had it, and the, the quadratic form and the scalar product have had a very tight link to the physics. Well, what about the coordinate formula, okay? Well, let's suppose I had two vectors. Let's say I have a vector u and a vector v. I'm just going to express those as like, as an x component times the vector ex, plus a t component times a vector et, similarly for v. OK, so in other words, u is just ux comma ut, and v is vx comma vt. But I want to use this kind of uh, basis vector notation to make it really explicit how these rules <coughs> just come um, force us to have the usual formula for the scalar product if ex and et t are a space-like and time-like unit vector, respectively, and they're orthogonal to each other. So all we do is we calculate uv, the scalar product, which we've mainly been using these formal rules for. We're going to use those one more time to relate it to this guy. Okay, So we're going to just insert those in here and then foil it out. So bear with me while I write it down here. OK, <clears throat> so ex with ex, that's a space-like unit vector. That's going to give you a 1, and then the coefficients are going to come out ux, vx. ex with et, that's going to be 0, because they're orthogonal. And that's by far the most important thing about what this coordinate system is supposed to do, so that we will have a nice, nice formulas. Okay, And then <clears throat> similarly with et and ex, those are orthogonal. It's a t. And then et with et, that's a unit vector but it's supposed to be the opposite sign. That's expressing the indefinite nature of this scalar product. And so you get minus the product of those coefficients, ut, vt. And that's exactly the formula that I had right at the start. <coughs> I said, change the plus in the usual scalar product formula to a minus, and all this stuff follows. Well, really, a better way to say it is change the word, the phrase positive definite to indefinite in the more abstract version, and everything follows. And then if you use an orthogonal unit vector coordinate system, these two orthogonal unit vectors, then you will be forced to use this very simple formula for the Minkowski scalar product. This formula is not true if you use a sort of a perverse coordinate system where the t and the x-axis, or whichever axes you, you want to call them, are not orthogonal to each other. Um, 
And so most of the time, you want to use this kind of coordinate system. Just like I, I said before, you could use a weird coordinate system for Euclidean geometry, a weird grid where the, the lines weren't orthogonal. But it, it, most of the time, it's not a great idea. Sometimes it is. There are, there are definitely cases. But it, if you can, you want to use something where they're orthogonal. Okay. So, <coughs> for example, uh, the Euclidean picture is like this is my coordinate system. And here's my friend's coordinate system superimposed on top of that. And they're both equally good, but they're going to give different values. So like if this is an x and a y coordinate, and then I have x prime and y prime, there's going to be some more or less complicated formulas relating x and y coordinates and x prime and y prime coordinates. I do not expect them to, be, to give the same answers. Similarly, in the Minkowski case in space-time, then here's a nice Minkowski coordinate system. And then here's another one. And again, it's kind of different. Oh, yeah, I should, well, that's fine. Here's another one. Here's some time like axes. And then the space like axes are going to be like this. They're not going to appear perpendicular, but they really are going to be perpendicular. So maybe this is the x prime and t prime, and these are the x here and the t. And it doesn't look like I've just changed this obviously orthogonal looking pair of a bunch of grid lines to another system of orthogonal ones. But of course, we're getting used to that now, that those really are orthogonal in the Minkowski way. Okay, So that's kind of the picture. So one of the things we'll, we'll want to do eventually is talk about the explicit transformations. So it'll be very analogous to rotating your coordinate system between x, y coordinates and x prime, y prime coordinates to describe the same exact geometric plane. And over here, we're going to do what's going to be called a Lorentz transformation, which is exactly the analog of Euclidean rotation, to go between an x, t and an x prime, t prime description of the same geometric plane.